A Memorable Murder, Part 2, Lewis has left off trying to force the door, he listens. Are the women trying to escape? He goes out of doors. Marin flies to the window, he comes round the corner of the house and confronts Aneth where she stands in the snow. The moonlight shines full in his face, she shrieks loudly and distinctly, Lewis, Lewis. Ah, he is discovered, he is recognized. Quick as thought he goes back to the front door, at the side of which stands an axe, left there by Marin, who had used it the day before to cut the ice from the well. He returns to Aneth standing shuddering there. It is no matter that she is beautiful, young, and helpless to resist, that she has been kind to him, that she never did a human creature harm, that she stretches her gentle hands out to him in agonized entreaty, crying piteously, Oh, Louis, Louis, Louis. He raises the axe and brings it down on her bright head in one tremendous blow, and she sinks without a sound and lies in a heap, with her warm blood reddening the snow. Then he deals her blow after blow, almost within reach of Marin's hands, as she stands at the window. Distracted, Marin strives to rouse poor Karen, who kneels with her head on the side of the bed, with desperate entreaty she tries to get her up and away, but Karen moans, I cannot, I cannot. She is too far gone, and then Marin knows she cannot save her, and that she must flee herself or die. So, while Louis again enters the house, she seizes a skirt and wraps round her shoulders, and makes her way out of the open window, over Anathy's murdered body, barefooted, flying away, anywhere, breathless, shaking with terror. Where can she go? Her little dog, frightened into silence, follows her, pressing so close to her feet that she falls over him more than once. Looking back she sees Louis has lit a lamp and is seeking for her. She flies to the cove, if she can but find his boat and row away in it and get help. It is not there, there is no boat in which she can get away. She hears Karen's wild screams, he is killing her. Oh, where can she go? Is there any place on that little island where he will not find her? She thinks she will creep into one of the empty old houses by the water, but no, she reflects, if I hide there, Ring will bark and betray me the moment Louis comes to look for me. And Ring saved her life, for next day Louis's bloody tracks were found all about those old buildings where he had sought her. She flies with Karen's awful cries in her ears, away over rocks and snow to the farthest limit she can gain. The moon has set, it is about two o'clock in the morning, and oh, so cold. She shivers and shudders from head to feet, but her agony of terror is so great she is hardly conscious of bodily sensation. And welcome is the freezing snow, the jagged ice and iron rocks that tear her unprotected feet, the bitter brine that beats against the shore, the winter winds that make her shrink and tremble, they are not so unkind as man's ingratitude. Falling often, rising, struggling on with feverish haste, she makes her way to the very edge of the water, down almost into the sea she creeps between two rocks, upon her hands and knees, and crouches, face downward, with ring nestled close beneath her breast, not daring to move through the long hours that must pass before the sun will rise again. She is so near the ocean she can almost reach the water with her hand. Had the wind breathed the least roughly the waves must have washed over her. There let us leave her and go back to Louis Wagner. Marin heard her sister Karen's shrieks as she fled. The poor girl had crept into an unoccupied room in a distant part of the house, striving to hide herself. He could not kill her with blows, blundering in the darkness, so he wound a handkerchief about her throat and strangled her. But now he seeks anxiously for Marin. Has she escaped? What terror is in the thought? Escaped, to tell the tale, to accuse him as the murderer of her sisters. Hurriedly, with desperate anxiety, he seeks for her. His time was growing short, it was not in his program that this brave little creature should give him so much trouble, he had not calculated on resistance from these weak and helpless women. Already it was morning, soon it would be daylight. He could not find her in or near the house, he went down to the empty and dilapidated houses about the cove, and sought her everywhere. What a picture! That blood-stained butcher, with his dark face, crawling about those cellars, peering for that woman. He dared not spend any more time, he must go back for the money he hoped to find, his reward for this. All about the house he searches, in bureau drawers, in trunks and boxes, he finds fifteen dollars for his night's work. Several hundreds were lying between some sheets folded at the bottom of a drawer in which he looked but he cannot stop for more thorough investigation, a dreadful haste pursues him like a thousand fiends. He drags Anathy's stiffening body into the house, and leaves it on the kitchen floor. 
If the thought crosses his mind to set fire to the house and burn up his two victims, he dares not do it, it will make a fatal bonfire to light his homeward way, besides, it is useless, for Marin has escaped to accuse him, and the time presses so horribly. But how cool a monster is he! After all this hard work he must have refreshment, to support him in the long row back to the land, knife and fork, cup and plate, were found next morning on the table near where Anath lay, fragments of food which was not cooked in the house, but brought from Portsmouth, were scattered about. Tidy Marin had left neither dishes nor food when they went to bed. The handle of the teapot which she had left on the stove was stained and smeared with blood. Can the human mind conceive of such hideous nonchalance? Wagner sat down in that room and ate and drank. It is almost beyond belief. Then he went to the well with a basin and towels, tried to wash off the blood, and left towels and basin in the well. He knows he must be gone. It is certain death to linger. He takes his boat and rows away toward the dark coast and the twinkling lights, it is for dear life, now. What powerful strokes send the small skiff rushing over the water. There is no longer any moon, the night is far spent, already the east changes, the stars fade, he rose like a madman to reach the land, but a blush of morning is stealing up the sky, and sunrise is rosy over shore and sea, when panting, trembling, weary, a creature accursed, a blot on the face of the day, he lands at Newcastle, too late. Too late. In vain he casts the dory adrift, she will not float away, the flood tide bears her back to give her testimony against him, and afterward she is found at Jaffrey's point, near the devil's den, and the fact of her worn thole pins noted. Wet, covered with ice from the spray which has flown from his eager oars, utterly exhausted, he creeps to a knoll and reconnoiters, he thinks he is unobserved, and crawls on towards Portsmouth. But he is seen and recognized by many persons, and his identity established beyond a doubt. He goes to the house of Matthew Johnson, where he has been living, steals upstairs, changes his clothes, and appears before the family, anxious, frightened, agitated, telling Johnson he never felt so badly in his life, that he has got into trouble and is afraid he shall be taken. He cannot eat at breakfast, says farewell forever, goes away and is shaved, and takes the train to Boston, where he provides himself with new clothes, shoes, a complete outfit, but lingering, held by fate, he cannot fly, and before night the officer's hand is on his shoulder and he is arrested. Meanwhile poor shuddering Marin on the lonely island, by the waterside, waits till the sun is high in heaven before she dares to come forth. She thinks he may be still on the island. She said to me, I thought he must be there, dead or alive. I thought he might go crazy and kill himself after having done all that. At last she steals out. The little dog frisks before her, it is so cold her feet cling to the rocks and snow at every step, till the skin is fairly torn off. Still and frosty as the bright morning, the water lies smiling and sparkling, the hammers of the workmen building the new hotel on Star Island sound through the quiet air. Being on the side of Smutty Nose opposite Star, she waves her skirt, and screams to attract their attention, they hear her, turn and look, see a woman waving a signal of distress, and, surprising to relate, turn tranquilly to their work again. She realizes at last there is no hope in that direction, she must go round toward Appledore in sight of the dreadful house. Passing it afar off she gives one swift glance toward it, terrified lest in the broad sunshine she may see some horrid token of last night's work, but all is still and peaceful. She notices the curtains the three had left up when they went to bed, they are now drawn down, she knows whose hand has done this, and what it hides from the light of day. Sick at heart, she makes her painful way to the northern edge of Malaga, which is connected with smutty nose by the old seawall. She is directly opposite Appledore and the little cottage where abide her friend and countryman, Jorge Edvard Ingebertsen, and his wife and children. Only a quarter of a mile of the still ocean separates her from safety and comfort. She sees the children playing about the door, she calls and calls. Will no one ever hear her? Her torn feet torment her, she is sore with blows and perishing with cold. At last her voice reaches the ears of the children, who run and tell their father that someone is crying and calling, looking across, he sees the poor little figure waving her arms, takes his dory and paddles over, and with amazement recognizes Marin in her nightdress, with bare feet and streaming hair, with a cruel bruise upon her face, with wild eyes, distracted, half senseless with cold and terror. He cries, Marin, Marin, who has done this? 
What is it? Who is it? And her only answer is, Louis, 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 as he takes her on board his boat and rows home with her as fast as he can. From her incoherent statement he learns what has happened. Leaving her in the care of his family, he comes over across the hill to the great house on Appledore. As I sit at my desk I see him pass the window, and wonder why the old man comes so fast and anxiously through the heavy snow. Presently I see him going back again, accompanied by several of his own countrymen and others of our workmen, carrying guns. They are going to smutty nose, and take arms, thinking it possible Wagner may yet be there. I call downstairs, what has happened, and am answered, some trouble at smutty nose, we hardly understand. Probably a drunken brawl of the reckless fishermen who may have landed there, I say to myself, and go on with my work. In another half hour I see the men returning, reinforced by others, coming fast, confusedly, and suddenly a wail of anguish comes up from the women below. I cannot believe it when I hear them crying, Karen is dead. Aneth is dead. Louis Wagner has murdered them both. I run out into the servants' quarters, there are all the men assembled, an awe-stricken crowd. Old Ingebertson comes forward and tells me the bare facts, and how Marin lies at his house, half crazy, suffering with her torn and frozen feet. Then, the men are dispatched to search Appledore, to find if by any chance the murderer might be concealed about the place, and I go over to Marin to see if I can do anything for her. I find the women and children with frightened faces at the little cottage, as I go into the room where Marin lies, she catches my hands, crying, Oh, I so glad to see you. I so glad I saved my life, and with her dry lips she tells me all the story as I have told it here. Poor little creature, holding me with those wild, glittering, dilated eyes, she cannot tell me rapidly enough the whole horrible tale. Upon her cheek is yet the blood stain from the blow he struck her with a chair, and she shows me two more upon her shoulder, and her torn feet. I go back for Arnica with which to bathe them. What a mockery seems to me that jocund day, as I emerge into the sunshine, and looking across the space of blue, sparkling water, see the house wherein all that horror lies. Oh, brightly shines the morning sun and glitters on the white sails of the little vessel that comes dancing back from Portsmouth before the favoring wind, with the two husbands on board. How glad they are for the sweet morning and the fair wind that brings them home again. And Ivan sees in fancy Anathe's face all beautiful with welcoming smiles, and John knows how happy his good and faithful Marin will be to see him back again. Alas, how little they dream what lies before them. From Appledore they are signaled to come ashore, and Ivan and Matthew, landing, hear a confused rumor of trouble from tongues that hardly can frame the words that must tell the dreadful truth. Ivan only understands that something is wrong. His one thought is for Aneth, he flies to Ingebertson's cottage, she may be there, he rushes in like a maniac, crying, Aneth, Aneth. Where is Aneth? And broken-hearted Marin answers her brother, Aneth is, at home. He does not wait for another word, but seizes the little boat and lands at the same time with John on smutty nose, with headlong haste they reach the house, other men accompanying them, ah, there are blood stains all about the snow. Ivan is the first to burst open the door and enter. What words can tell it? There upon the floor, naked, stiff and stark, is the woman he idolizes, for whose dear feet he could not make life's ways smooth and pleasant enough, stone dead. Dead, horribly butchered, her bright hair stiff with blood, the fair head that had so often rested on his breast crushed, cloven, mangled with the brutal axe. Their eyes are blasted by the intolerable sight, both John and Ivan stagger out and fall, senseless, in the snow. Poor Ivan, his wife a thousand times adored, the dear girl he had brought from Norway, the good, sweet girl who loved him so, whom he could not cherish tenderly enough. And he was not there to protect her. There was no one there to save her. Did heaven look on? And would not take their part. Poor fellow, what had he done that fate should deal him such a blow as this? Dumb, blind with anguish, he made no sign. What says the body when they spring some monstrous torture engine's whole strength on it? No more says the soul. Some of his pitying comrades lead him away, like one stupefied, and take him back to Appledore. John knows his wife is safe. Though stricken with horror and consumed with wrath, he is not paralyzed like poor Ivan, who has been smitten with worse than death. They find Karen's body in another part of the house, covered with blows and black in the face, strangled. 
They find Lewis's tracks, all the tokens of his disastrous presence, the contents of trunks and drawers scattered about in his hasty search for the money, and all within the house and without, blood, blood, everywhere. When I reach the cottage with the arnica for Marin, they have returned to smutty nose. John, her husband, is there. He is a young man of the true Norse type, blue-eyed, fair-haired, tall and well-made, with handsome teeth and bronzed beard. Perhaps he is a little quiet and undemonstrative generally, but at this moment he is superb, kindled from head to feet, a firebrand of woe and wrath, with eyes that flash and cheeks that burn. I speak a few words to him, what words can meet such an occasion as this, and having given directions about the use of the arnica, for Marin, I go away, for nothing more can be done for her, and every comfort she needs is hers. The outer room is full of men, they make way for me, and as I pass through I catch a glimpse of Ivan crouched with his arms thrown round his knees and his head bowed down between them, motionless, his attitude expressing such abandonment of despair as cannot be described. His whole person seems to shrink, as if deprecating the blow that has fallen upon him. All day the slaughtered women lie as they were found, for nothing can be touched till the officers of the law have seen the whole. And John goes back to Portsmouth to tell his tale to the proper authorities. What a different voyage from the one he had just taken, when happy and careless he was returning to the home he had left so full of peace and comfort. What a load he bears back with him, as he makes his tedious way across the miles that separate him from the means of vengeance he burns to reach. But at last he arrives, tells his story, the police at other cities are at once telegraphed, and the city marshal follows Wagner to Boston. At eight o'clock that evening comes the steamer Mayflower to the Shoals. With all the officers on board. They land and make investigations at Smutty Nose, then come here to Appledore and examine Marin, and, when everything is done, steam back to Portsmouth, which they reach at three o'clock in the morning. After all are gone and his awful day's work is finished at last, poor John comes back to Marin, and kneeling by the side of her bed, he is utterly overpowered with what he has passed through, he is shaken with sobs as he cries, Oh, Marin, Marin, it is too much, too much. I cannot bear it, and Marin throws her arms about his neck, crying, Oh, John, John, don't. I shall be crazy, I shall die, if you go on like that. Poor innocent, unhappy people, who never wronged a fellow creature in their lives. But Ivan, what is their anguish to his? They dare not leave him alone lest he do himself an injury. He is perfectly mute and listless, he cannot weep, he can neither eat nor sleep. He sits like one in a horrid dream. Oh, my poor, poor brother. Marin cries in tones of deepest grief, when I speak his name to her next day. She herself cannot rest a moment till she hears that Louis is taken, at every sound her crazed imagination fancies he is coming back for her, she is fairly beside herself with terror and anxiety, but the night following that of the catastrophe brings us news that he is arrested, and there is stern rejoicing at the shoals, but no vengeance on him can bring back those unoffending lives, or restore that gentle home. The dead are properly cared for, the blood is washed from Anathy's beautiful bright hair, she is clothed in her wedding dress, the blue dress in which she was married, poor child, that happy Christmas time in Norway, a little more than a year ago. They are carried across the sea to Portsmouth, the burial service is read over them, and they are hidden in the earth. After poor Ivan has seen the faces of his wife and sister still and pale in their coffins, their ghastly wounds concealed as much as possible, flowers upon them and the priest praying over them, his trance of misery is broken, the grasp of despair is loosened a little about his heart. Yet hardly does he notice whether the sun shines or no, or care whether he lives or dies. Slowly his senses steady themselves from the effects of a shock that nearly destroyed him, and merciful time, with imperceptible touch, softens day by day the outlines of that picture, at the memory of which he will never cease to shudder while he lives. Louis Wagner was captured in Boston on the evening of the next day after his atrocious deed, and Friday morning, followed by a hooting mob, he was taken to the Eastern Depot. At every station along the route crowds were assembled, and there were fierce cries for vengeance. At the depot in Portsmouth a dense crowd of thousands of both sexes had gathered, who assailed him with yells and curses and cries of tear him to pieces. It was with difficulty he was at last safely imprisoned. Poor Marin was taken to Portsmouth from Appledore on that day. 
The story of Wagner's day in Boston, like every other detail of the affair, has been told by every newspaper in the country, his agitation and restlessness, noted by all who saw him, his curious, reckless talk. To one he says, I have just killed two sailors, to another, Jacob Toltman, into whose shop he goes to buy shoes, I have seen a woman lie as still as that boot, and so on. When he is caught he puts on a bold face and determines to brave it out, denies everything with tears and virtuous indignation. The men whom he has so fearfully wronged are confronted with him, his attitude is one of injured innocence, he surveys them more in sorrow than in anger, while John is on fire with wrath and indignation, and hurls maledictions at him, but Ivan, poor Ivan, hurt beyond all hope or help, is utterly mute, he does not utter one word. Of what use is it to curse the murderer of his wife? It will not bring her back, he has no heart for cursing, he is too completely broken. Marin told me the first time she was brought into Lewis's presence, her heart leapt so fast she could hardly breathe. She entered the room softly with her husband and Matthew Johnson's daughter. Lewis was whittling a stick. He looked up and saw her face, and the color ebbed out of his, and rushed back and stood in one burning spot in his cheek, as he looked at her and she looked at him for a space, in silence. Then he drew about his evil mind the detestable garment of sanctimoniousness, and in sentimental accents he murmured, I'm glad Jesus loves me. The devil loves you, cried John, with uncompromising veracity. I know it wasn't nice, said decorous Marin, but John couldn't help it, it was too much to bear. The next Saturday afternoon, when he was to be taken to Saco, hundreds of fishermen came to Portsmouth from all parts of the coast, determined on his destruction, and there was a fearful scene in the quiet streets of that peaceful city when he was being escorted to the train by the police and various officers of justice. Two thousand people had assembled, and such a furious, yelling crowd was never seen or heard in Portsmouth. The air was rent with cries for vengeance, showers of bricks and stones were thrown from all directions, and wounded several of the officers who surrounded Wagner. His knees trembled under him, he shook like an aspen, and the officers found it necessary to drag him along, telling him he must keep up if he would save his life. Except that they feared to injure the innocent as well as the guilty, those men would have literally torn him to pieces. But at last he was put on board the cars in safety, and carried away to prison. His demeanor throughout the term of his confinement, and during his trial and subsequent imprisonment, was a wonderful piece of acting. He really inspired people with doubt as to his guilt. I make an extract from the Portsmouth Chronicle, dated March 13, 1873. Wagner still retains his amazing sang Freud, which is wonderful, even in a strong nerved German. The sympathy of most of the visitors at his jail has certainly been won by his calmness and his general appearance, which is quite prepossessing. This little instance of his method of proceeding I must subjoin, a lady who had come to converse with him on the subject of his eternal salvation said, as she left him, I hope you put your trust in the Lord, to which he sweetly answered, I always did, ma'am, and I always shall. A few weeks after all this had happened, I sat by the window one afternoon, and, looking up from my work, I saw some one passing slowly, a young man who seemed so thin, so pale, so bent and ill, that I said, here is some stranger who is so very sick, he is probably come to try the effect of the air, even thus early. It was Ivan Christensen. I did not recognize him. He dragged one foot after the other wearily, and walked with the feeble motion of an old man. He entered the house, his errand was to ask for work. He could not bear to go away from the neighborhood of the place where Aneth had lived and where they had been so happy, and he could not bear to work at fishing on the south side of the island, within sight of that house. There was work enough for him here, a kind voice told him so, a kind hand was laid on his shoulder, and he was bidden come and welcome. The tears rushed into the poor fellow's eyes, he went hastily away, and that night sent over his chest of tools, he was a carpenter by trade. Next day he took up his abode here and worked all summer. Every day I carefully observed him as I passed him by, regarding him with an inexpressible pity, of which he was perfectly unconscious, as he seemed to be of everything and everybody. He never raised his head when he answered my good morning, or good evening, Ivan. Though I often wished to speak, I never said more to him, for he seemed to me to be hurt too sorely to be touched by human hand. With his head sunk on his breast, and wearily dragging his limbs, he pushed the plane or drove the saw to and fro with a kind of dogged persistence, looking neither to the left nor right. 
Well might the weight of woe he carried bow him to the earth. By and by he spoke, himself, to other members of the household, saying, with a patient sorrow, he believed it was to have been, it had so been ordered, else why did all things so play into Lewis's hands? All things were furnished him, the knowledge of the unprotected state of the women, a perfectly clear field in which to carry out his plans, just the right boat he wanted in which to make his voyage, fair tide, fair wind, calm sea, just moonlight enough, even the axe with which to kill Aneth stood ready to his hand at the house door. Alas, it was to have been. Last summer Ivan went back again to Norway, alone. Hardly is it probable that he will ever return to a land whose welcome to him fate made so horrible. His sister Marin and her husband still live blameless lives, with the little dog Ring, in a new home they have made for themselves in Portsmouth, not far from the riverside. The merciful lapse of days and years takes them gently but surely away from the thought of that season of anguish, and though they can never forget it all, they have grown resigned and quiet again. And on the island other Norwegians have settled, voices of charming children sound sweetly in the solitude that echoed so awfully to the shrieks of Karen and Marin. But to the weirdness of the winter midnight something is added, a vision of two dim, reproachful shades who watch while an agonized ghost prowls eternally about the dilapidated houses at the beach's edge, close by the black, whispering water, seeking for the woman who has escaped him, escaped to bring upon him the death he deserves, whom he never, never, never can find, though his distracted spirit may search till man shall vanish from off the face of the earth, and time shall be no more.